and it's uh, one of the first talks that I actually did where the tooling that I used um, sort of helped me tell the story a little bit better. So I used uh, our markdown uh, slides to make this slide deck. Uh, and it really was one of the things that made, uh, made it possible for me to even give this talk. Uh, I started with PowerPoint and Keynote and I remember feeling like I need to be able to use data visualizations from ggplot and here I am making them in the script and then exporting the files and then putting them into these slide decks and I couldn't quite get things to look lined up the way I wanted to and to be able to tell a continuous story and ultimately it sort of forced me into this corner of needing to make some slides with our markdown because I thought this is just this is this is something that is going to probably pay it forward in terms of my time spent learning it now. Uh, so, so this is one of my earlier decks that I've sort of remixed a few times now, but uh, it's basically the story of a single plot. Uh, so that's why I called it, uh, you know, a case study with R and GG plot. I'm going to make this full screen real quick. Uh, because this was uh, a plot that I made uh, for my work and it was one of those things where it was one of my kind of early projects that I knew I wanted to do with R and it helped me to learn ggplot but it also helped me to think better about the problem that I had uh, in the first place and the things that I was trying to communicate with because a lot of what I've found the more I've worked with R and the more I've kind of expanded my knowledge of the different tool chains that are available, like our markdown, like tidyverse, um, is that a lot of times when I learn new skills, it helps me to think about my own problems in a different way and helps me kind of take a different perspective. So one of the questions that I got during the last time I gave this presentation in uh, Melbourne, uh, I guess 2019, gosh, um, was uh, was whether I felt like you know what I learned from this case study was um, you know, changed the way I thought about the problem at all, or was it really just that I got better at the tools? And my answer uh, at the very beginning at the outset to you all is that I think these things are always intertwined. Uh, I think as you learn more tools and learn new skills, it changes the way that you approach problems and changes the things that you even think are possible. Um, so uh, I will give a brief introduction. Uh, you can find me at all of these links. Um, I have, oops, let's see, there we go. Ugh. There we go. Uh, so I have a website that I'm trying to keep updated with a blog um, during the pandemic. It has not been kind to probably mom bloggers as I consider myself, but uh, I am also pretty active on Twitter and try to engage with the R community there. Uh, and then you can see some of my work on my personal GitHub, but I also spend a lot of time in the R Studio organization contributing to our packages there as well. Uh, and as was indicated, I have recently kind of switched roles at our studio. So I was uh, originally about two years ago, I started uh, as a data scientist and professional educator at our studio. I had begun my career as a professor though, uh, and I had worked my way up to an associate professor in a university, um, Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, Oregon. And I'd worked really hard doing autism research and I really loved it, but I had also kind of discovered this love for data science and using R to solve problems. Uh, and so I transitioned out of academia and joined the R studio team and became really passionate about data science education. Um, and then more recently, I've sort of been feeling the itch to really contribute more on the package development side, not necessarily as a package developer, but somebody who can help maybe scope out problems and be a little bit more proactive on the development of new features or on um, things that need to be changed or documentation. All of the things that I think are kind of the rough edges that I, um, I witnessed as an educator and the things that I kind of tried to design out when I taught, I'm kind of trying to go back now and have better conversations with developers now that I know more about their processes and their tools um, and figure out ways to actually like fix the root of the problem. So uh, I like to think of it as more like education, but not in the postmortem sense. So my, um, my role is now a product manager of data science communication at our studio. And so that's kind of my main focus is trying to make data science communication a little bit easier, something where maybe some something where maybe you dreaded doing some work because you thought it was going to be like a six hour problem. I would like to kind of try to make those closer to like one or two hour problems. Um, making a slide deck with our markdown might be one of those things that you might be scared of doing and it probably uh, could be less time spent now um, on a problem. So, so that's my current uh, focus. Um, and this original uh, 
plot that I made was um, was sort of inspired by a, a kind of framework that my co-instructor when I used to teach at OHSU uh, put together and I really loved this two by two so when we taught data visualization we talked to our students about like okay so think about these two kind of really broad axes like you have this scale on you know not really useful to useful and ugly to pretty and you'd like to aim for that like right quadrant right like aim here you'd like for it to be useful and pretty um and th that's really kind of where uh where my motivation came from was i had uh, an existing plot and i wanted to make it better and i wanted to make it both useful and pretty so this kind of started me on a little bit of a journey because I knew I wanted to make this plot better, but I didn't really quite have in my mind how to do that. And I didn't really have the skills to be able to do that yet. Uh, so the background is that at the time uh, when I made this uh, original plot, it was part of a larger research program where I was focused on communicating statistics about autism prevalence. Uh, and so this might be something that you might be familiar with it definitely got a lot more attention in the popular media um, uh, around the time that we we were trying to write more kind of book chapters and explanations to help people understand the numbers that were getting reported because it was pretty frequent to see some kind of alarming statistics on the news about how the prevalence of autism spectrum disorders was increasing in these different countries and what's driving this, you know, is this an epidemic or, you know, these, these numbers seem like they're skyrocketing, you know, you'd always hear kind of these hyperbolic statements about it. And so this is a pretty common plot that you might have seen about the number of people with autism spectrum disorder and how many are affected around the world. Um, males are much more likely to be uh, diagnosed than females. And so that's what this um, part of this plot is showing you. But it's also just showing you a general increase over time from 1990 to 2017. And this is from our world and data. Uh, so this is not a totally uncommon kind of plot that you would see to talk about how the prevalence of autism spectrum disorders um, uh, is increasing around the world. This is another plot that is pretty common. So this one, I believe I have a citation on the slide, but I can't see it due to my slide or due to my own. There we go, it's from nature. Uh, so diagnosis rising, um, and this, this looks like a, some alarming numbers, right? The increase looks quite intense. Um, from 1975 to 2009, um, by some counts, autism diagnoses have climbed steadily since the 1970s. Uh, some research has found explanation for more than half of the rise, right? Um, so this is also a pretty common uh, plot that you might see associated with autism prevalence. Uh, here's another one. This one is put out by Autism Speaks. Um, and again, you know, you see an increasing rise and you, uh, you see uh, the numbers are telling you, uh, I believe the individuals under, or they're for uh, individuals four years prior to, the, so these are for individuals who are age eight uh, in a study from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the United States. So the idea is that in uh, 2004, in one of the first early uh, surveys of autism prevalence in the United States, there was about one in 166 eight-year-olds who were diagnosed. And then by 2018, this was up to one in 59. So all of these things are understandably things that would cause parents, individuals to you know, be concerned about why is the prevalence rising? Should we be, um, you know, should we be taking intense action? Is this an epidemic? This is another uh, kind of famous plot uh, about autism prevalence. So this is from California showing um, statistics. Oh, and I believe that date is wrong. Uh, it should be 19, I think 81, uh, not, not 1931. There's no statistics for that. Uh, for eight-year-olds um, uh, up to 2014, I believe. And so this is showing you data um, from three different sort of studies that are um, put all together here in different colors. So uh, the black one called uh, ADDM, that's the Autism and Developmental Disabilities Monitoring Network, and that's actually the CDC data. So that's a survey that the CDC does every few years uh, with new cohorts of eight-year-olds. And then this was comparing, this was primarily comparing um, uh, in this study to uh, data from CDDS, which I believe is California Developmental Disability Services. And so that's the one in hot pink. And so the, um, the message here was looking at individuals who are accessing services in California and showing that the rates had very much increased as well, though not to the same level that the ADDM numbers were reporting. But uh, the story here was generally that numbers were increasing, numbers are getting higher.
Oops. Um, so I started this project because I signed on to work with a very prolific and prominent autism researcher who had a book chapter on autism prevalence. And he, he usually did talks around the country and around the world actually about trying to explain to lay people or even just doctors, nurses, people who need to be able to have actionable um, uh, messages that they take away from the statistics. Uh, he had these presentations and these book chapters that he was using to try to communicate about the things that he thought were important to understand uh, about autism prevalence estimates and how to use those to interpret the statistics that you were seeing. Um, so he passed me this one uh, graph and it was in a, a PowerPoint. So I call it my V1 PowerPoint slide. Um, and so this is kind of the beginning of my song of don't make it bad. <laughs> um, so this is what I started with. Uh, and sometimes when I give this talk in person, people like gasp. Um, but I'm going to tell you that I actually think this plot is not as bad as I even originally thought when I first started this project. Um, this was one of his slides that he used and he found that it really had an impact with people because it communicated something that the data doesn't show you. And I think that's actually a really powerful idea. Um, so this is a slide intended to communicate about the prevalence of autism and how it might be affected, the numbers that you see reported, how it might be affected by the access to services that the population has. And so you can see if you look just on the left, he has it labeled below low access to services. So each of those dots is perhaps maybe an individual with autism in, a, in that community. Um, so in a community with low access to services, the population is in the green box, but the population in that little purple or hot pink uh, circle are the individuals who have the disorder but are also um, accessing services. Uh, on the right, in contrast, what you see is an area or a region that might have high access to services. So meaning that there's, um, there's much more opportunity for these individuals uh, to get services that might help them. So maybe educational services, behavioral services, um, uh, medical services, things like that. And so on the right, what you see is the same prevalence, uh, so the same number of individuals affected with autism as on the left, but more of those little dots are clustered uh, in the center, meaning that more individuals who are affected are actually getting services. And so the dots are more spread out in the green box because there's less individuals who are not affected. Um, so there's a lot of things that you could say about this plot or this, it's not necessarily a plot because it's not showing real data. It's, it's using, uh, using sort of data-like um, uh, elements to communicate a message. Um, but there's a lot of things that I found a little bit confusing <laughs> about this plot at first. Um, so here's my blameless postmortem of uh, this plot. Um, one thing to take away from it is that the pink is always less than the green. So that means we're always underestimating the prevalence of autism in a community. Um, and this is a really important takeaway, even though it's not necessarily something that jumps out at you, it's not the main point of it, but it's the reason why the plot looks, he, he started with the, the graphic the way he did. Um, more dots in the pink blob mean that more people are getting services. Uh, so that's a little bit kind of, uh, obvious maybe, but it's counterintuitive because the true prevalence, the total number of dots actually looks different on both panels. So you, um, that's why he has that little message at the bottom that says same prevalence in the two arrows. Uh, and so that's because it, it's sort of counterintuitive. And when I first got this graphic uh, in my inbox, I actually did count the dots <laughs> because I was like, how do I know that the dots are the same? I didn't totally believe it. Um, and in hindsight, I, at first, I really did not like this plot. We called it sort of like the dreaded dot plot. And we were tr really trying to figure out how to make, uh, how to make this something that we could all feel really good about and was helpful. Um, and I ended up actually liking the dots <laughs> and I returned to this later. Um, and the reason why I actually like the dots uh, is because it allows you to say a very important sentence that I think is important when you're communicating about uh, data. And that is that uh, every dot is a blank. So I feel like that's a really nice framing for any kind of plot that you have, whether you have a bar chart or you have a scatter plot, um, whatever geometric aesthetic object you're using, 
is to be able to say, I have one dot per. And so here, the nice thing about the dots that he was using is that I have one dot per individual affected by autism in the population. And then the ones in the, the, the pink are the ones who are getting services and the ones in the green are not accessing services. So I had this idea uh, to think more about what is, what is the message here? Like what, what, what is the thing that he wanted to say out loud to people that this graphic, this visual could help him uh, be able to communicate easier? So really the message for him that he kind of used this figure to drive home about was, is there an autism epidemic is the question. And then based on the data available, we don't know. So his point was to say it might look like the prevalence is increasing um, of uh, diagnoses, but it has to do with how many individuals might be accessing services. So we kind of sought out with that framing to figure out a better way to maybe tell that message uh, in a way that might be a little bit more intuitive for people to hear. Uh, and then what is the medium behind this message? Uh, so we started off by writing a book chapter, uh, and this was for the Handbook of Autism and Pervasive Developmental Disorders, which is published uh, on a pretty regular cadence every few years. It's usually like a two or three volume book with book chapters by sort of internationally recognized experts in autism spectrum disorders uh, in their relevant fields. So there's usually a chapter on neuroscience, a chapter on language, um, a chapter on, you know, maybe social behaviors. And so um, the, the person that I was working with was one of the kind of most well-respected experts in the area of autism uh, epidemiology. So it was a book chapter on the epidemiology of autism spectrum disorders. Um, but also presentations like this one. So he often did presentations for people in the community uh, who maybe were educators or they were medical providers and they had concerns. They wanted to understand how to better understand the data that was being presented to them. So if I were to go back to my two by two, I would classify my original V1 PowerPoint as, you know, sort of, <laughs> it, it's not crap. <laughs> I thought it was actually useful, but it was a little ugly, um, but it was useful. Um, it wasn't meaningless. And it did allow you to kind of verbally walk through um, the, the problem space and the, the message. So version two, uh, at this point, I was still kind of in a point where I hadn't started using R really fluently yet. So version two was a dot doc file um, because my problem was uh, really thinking about this as a data problem. I hadn't at this point decided this was a data problem. Um, so I was trying to take a sad plot and make it better. Um, so I created this in a doc file. Um, so this is sort of, uh, to me, like one that I really had to dig up and um, uh, dig out my confidence to show you all because it's actually published in a book chapter. This is a published figure that I did um, and I made it. <laughs> and I, I feel a little bit of shame about it, but at least I can laugh about it now years later. Uh, so this is sort of the hybrid plot that I came up with to show what I thought were kind of the takeaways that we wanted to communicate. Um, so if you kind of parse it, it is sort of saying the two messages uh, that I had gotten out of the original that um, uh, my co-author had brought to me, which is that on the first part, you can see like over time that even though the true population prevalence is staying the same, it's flatlining, it hasn't increased from time one to time two, whatever those may be. Um, but on the bottom part, you can see, not the bottom, not the candy coated shells. I'll explain that in a second. But the bottom line there in that first chunk shows you that at time one, uh, you still have a lower number of people accessing services, but then at time two, that has increased. So the idea is that if the prevalence is estimated just by individuals accessing services at two time points, it could look like there's this um, illusion of this increase, like this explosion in prevalence even. Like here, what you're seeing um, in that non-dotted line, that solid line, is a 200% increase over time. Uh, yet still we're underestimating prevalence at both time points and the true prevalence has held steady actually. So the point of this being to say that we A, may still be underestimating, um, but B also, uh, you know, the prevalence, the, the increase that you're seeing may be just an illusion of the fact that maybe services are getting better or simply more individuals are being um, referred for services. Uh, and then the bottom part, 
was my way of showing the percent of individuals accessing services. So you can see that I, and I still can't figure out how to recreate these actually in Word uh, or in Excel, because somehow I managed to get this like candy coated sheen on the outside, which I find like, you know, just in hindsight, like I don't know what, what my brain was thinking when I thought, oh, that's a nice effect there. That's very nice. Uh, making these sort of like 3D grayscale um, M&Ms. Uh, but you can see that the, the pie wedge is small for the individuals accessing services at time one versus more individuals accessing services at time two. So this was my, my version two, um, which I felt like was in <laughs> about a month after we published it, I was like, oh man, that's a rough one. <laughs> um, I'm not terribly happy with that. Uh, so my full of blame postmortem for the one that I created um, is that it's a Franken plot. Uh, I somehow managed to make pie charts worse. I had two of them, first of all, but then I also have this like line, uh, line graph above it. Uh, and then I also have these sort of candy coated pies below. Um, so, you know, in my two by two, I would sort of rank my own plot as basically crap and ugly. It's a little bit harder to walk through. I think the, um, the first you know, graphic uh, that I was provided with uh, was actually a little bit easier to talk through for me, whereas the second one is a little bit harder and I feel like um, it means that I have to say more words. I'm gesturing more, which is a good sign that I don't really have the things on the screen, the, the pixels that you're looking at that help me tell the story that I wanted to tell. So my own ranking of my, my revised uh, sad plot, make it better, was that I actually probably made it worse. But I did start to understand the problem space a little bit better. Uh, and I got a lot more experience talking to people out loud about the thing that I was trying to communicate with this plot. So version three is about when I started getting a little bit more comfortable with R and I, I had used ggplot in my own research when I had data, but at this point I was thinking, okay, maybe there's, maybe there's a way to do this in R and I just haven't really thought about this yet. Um, so this is where I, I think I began to make it better. So uh, at least at this point, I knew that I didn't know enough to know how to get started. I asked a few people in my department when I was at OHSU, like, hey, here's this plot. I'm embarrassed about it, but like without shaming me, like let's just talk about, you know, ways to make it better. And I got some great advice about how to make it better, uh, conceptually, but I really knew that I needed somebody to help me um, think through how to actually do that and if I could do it in R because I was recognizing that even in Excel or Word, my problem with the dots, I wanted to go back to the dots. I knew at some point I needed to, but being able to count out how many dots were, there were <laughs> um, and making sure that that was the same across the plots, it just it started to feel like more of a data problem than, than what I had originally thought. So. At the time, there was this website, which I believe is actually still up. It may not be very active now, um, but it was called Help Me Viz. Uh, and it's a place to facilitate discussion, debate, and collaboration from the data visualization community. And so Help Me Viz is a website where you could post your plots and open it up to anyone who has a comment for you, <laughs> which is also terrifying, but I thought I'm, I'm gonna give it a shot and see what I get out of this. So I submitted my, uh, my version two to help me viz. Um, and in, in there, uh, they were so kind and nice that they actually created a new category for my plot. It was such an abomination that they put it into this separate category that I have circled on this page called combination chart, which you, you'll never be taught how to make a combination chart in a data visualization class. You should not be. Um, Jonathan, <laughs> the, the person who moderates this website, uh, created this category just for me. So to this day, if you go to the Help Me Viz website and you click on combination chart. Mine is the lonely, sad plot there. Um, so uh, it was a very kind way to basically um, tell me that I didn't fit into any normal data visualization category. You can see all these things that you recognize, like box, box and whisker plots, bubble charts, chloroplots, column chart, area chart, all of these things that are, are very typical plots to make. And then there's me hanging out in my combination chart. So on uh, May 6, 2015, uh, my combination chart got posted on Help Me Viz. 
And a very kind person who I hope to someday uh, be able to connect with uh, responded pretty quickly uh, after it was posted and said, well, <laughs> this was actually not the first person who responded. The first person who responded, uh, you know, uh, essentially mansplained to me that I didn't need to make a plot to show this and that I didn't need this at all. And I, I kind of wrote back and basically said, um, you know, thanks, but I actually do for, you know, the reason I asked is because I actually need a, uh, something. Um, to, to help structure this this message here um, and uh, then this very kind person Jeff responded and so what he's responding to here it says at first I had the same thought as Jean which is the person who uh, told me this doesn't need a plot um, I get it does this really need a chart uh, but then my wife is a grade school teacher and we talk about this phenomenon once in a while so at this point, I was like, yes, Jeff Harrison, <laughs> you have a wife who's a school teacher and you understand, you know, kind of the problem space that I'm in. So he said, I see two things to improve on the original. The fact that the two charts makes it harder to figure out than needed. And yeah, totally agree. That was my Franken chart. And the trend line clearly slopes upward, but doesn't make you compare the start and end points. And that was a really good point for me too, is that I, when I was discussing this, when I'd be presenting this, I often felt like I was walking around and doing a lot of gesturing around the lines. Um, and so that was a really good point that I hadn't considered. And then he said, here's one approach that addresses both. It needs more labeling, et cetera, but you get the idea. And what he passed to me was a GG plot graphic. And that was kind of the first time where I was like, oh, I could use ggplot too, even though there is no actual data here. This is not real data that I'm visualizing. Uh, what I was already doing to make the Excel abomination combination chart plot that I made was I was creating a little mini data set. I had numbers on there because obviously I had lines that were going up and lines that were going across. I had created fake numbers and it just didn't occur to me that I could create fake numbers in R and then um, use ggplot to plot not real data. I'd only worked with data frames and I had this sort of rigid mindset that that's what ggplot was for, was for visualizing real data. So I went back to the drawing board and I wrote a little bit of code. Um, uh, I set my random seed and I created a small little tibble of time one and time two data. I gathered it up and I created a little 200 row tibble with two columns x and y um, where x was whether or not it was time one or time two measurement and y was the number of individuals affected and i was calculate i was um i wanted to talk about this uh out of 100 children so at time one in that first row you can see that i was thinking that there would be 33 individuals out of 100 uh, who would be um, affected by autism or who would be accessing services and so here on this next chunk of code, I took that information and I added one column to it that said whether or not they were accessing services or not. So services was zero um, and uh, one was whether they were accessing services. So I basically made it so that uh, time one um, looked like there was less individuals accessing services, whereas at time two, there was more individuals accessing services. Uh, and so this is art by my uh, former intern and now colleague at our studio, Desiree de Leon. Uh, I will make Gigi put my canvas. And so at this point I had this data, I had this tibble of fake data and I started to try to recreate the, the plot that Jeff Harrison had provided to me and that helped me viz. Um, so this is what I created and this is what he had provided to me. Um, and so we have on the X axis time one uh, and then time two um, on the right and the count is overall 100 individuals affected with autism at both time points. But I have at time one, you can see that I have the, the pink color is services zero. So that was people not accessing services. And so you can see that that number uh, decreases at time two. So there's, uh, there's less individuals not accessing services. And so what that means is that the blue bar is getting bigger. So it starts with not as many individuals who are affected accessing services. And then at time two, that goes up. So I started playing with this and then I started iterating once I had the basic structure down. I started playing with different colors. Uh, I started kind of trying to take away things that might have been extraneous that I felt like were distracting. 
uh, I started playing with the annotation a little bit. So now you can see that my Y axis label is uh, ASD cases per 10,000 individuals. So um, you can see that, you know, that still the columns are the same height overall, but what's changing is the proportion of individuals within each column that are accessing and not accessing services. So I played with sort of a, a direct labeling here on the columns. And this was all um, experimentation that I was doing sort of, um, uh, in the service of making this plot better, but every step of the, this, I was learning something new about how to work with ggplot. I was asking myself new questions to say, okay, I want it to look this way. How do I do that? Um, and learning about what was possible and what was not possible. So then I started thinking, okay, I want to add in a little bit more annotation, not just to the data points, but I'm going to add this like line across the top and maybe add some words to the right. So now I have, you know, this line going across at the number 100. So that means that the estimates of prevalence based on population sampling, which is um, sort of a, a conceptually, it's the idea of if I had a perfect sample of all of the population um, of individuals with autism. So that'll remain stable over time if the true prevalence is stable. And then I managed to get this little blue line going across to kind of draw your eye um, from time one to time two, and then added this annotation of estimates of prevalence based on individuals accessing services can create an illusion of an increase in prevalence over time, yet still underestimate prevalence at both time points. So you're still noticing that the blue bars are always going to be lower than 100, but I've made a little bit more of a link there with that blue line to make your eye kind of follow and see that that proportion is going up. Um, and I liked the idea of having some annotation, especially for a book chapter because you can't trust that people are going to read all the text below um, a graphic and I didn't want it to be misinterpreted and it also seemed like a nice use of space and a way to kind of make um, make a, a simple visualization a little bit easier to digest in one in one sitting rather than referring back and forth between text and the graphic. So that was my kind of V3. Uh, and I felt like I got to a point where it was maybe not as useful as the first one still, but I still felt like this was, this was prettier. <laughs> it was more useful than my V2. And I liked the ability to iterate. And I liked the idea of being able to make it this way and make it um, something that I could uh, you know, change over time or update more easily. So I got a little bit obsessed with making this plot better <laughs> after that one. So that one was actually a published plot that ended up in a different book chapter um, that I published with my co-author. And then I, I got on this cycle of about every, every six months or so, we'd get this new invitation to do a book chapter um, for a new book about autism spectrum disorders. And everyone always wanted a chapter about autism epidemiology. So I realized that this was happening as a pattern. And I, I sort of took it upon myself to every time I had to remake it for a book chapter to, to make it a little bit better. Um, and that's one of my favorite things about ggplot. So I tried to make it better every single time I got a chance to, and I constantly asked for feedback from collaborators and colleagues, parents, um, other researchers. And I have, uh, I've, I think made it better <laughs> still, but I still actually like the V3 version. It wasn't too bad, but this is why I love ggplot because it was really easy for me to iterate and I could sit in meetings with people and just show them like, oh, okay, here's, here's what you just described to me. Is this kind of more along the lines of what you were thinking? And I could really quickly make a new figure um, and, uh, and try things out, be a little bit more experimental. So I decided to go back to the dot idea that my uh, that I started with because I really liked, as I said, being able to say out loud that I have one dot per individual affected by autism because I felt like with the columns, it was a little confusing. It's sort of like this big, you know, big column of, you know, holding individuals, but they're really just individuals who are affected by autism. So here you can see every single dot is a human now. Um, and then I still did the coloring um, and I decided to kind of go all in making this sort of my masterpiece. <laughs> so I added in more annotations again. I figured out that you could do this kind of like uh, labeling that I wanted to do that I couldn't uh, figure out before when I was doing the columns. So when I had the dots, I was able to do the color labels, which I liked. Um, so I added ASD cases who are not accessing services and accessing services. So it was a little bit of a change in the wording from before where um, where I had colored the columns because I thought it was easier to say out loud if you were talking about each dot is an individual, then each, um, each yellow dot is an individual not accessing services and each green dot is an individual accessing services. So it made it a little bit easier to map words onto um, the graphic. 
Uh, and then I started playing. I was like, oh, I can change the background here. I can actually bring my columns back. I think I decided I didn't love the columns back. <laughs> so I went with just flat out dots again. Um, and this was actually kind of hard for me. Um, uh, logistically, you don't see this when I'm showing you this now, but getting those dots on every single version of this to line up the same is actually a little bit hard because I'm, ha I'm having to set a random seed every time when I actually plot because these are jittered plots. Um, so this taught me a lot about um, how to work with ggplot in general. Um, so if you look at the R markdown actually for my slides, you'll see a lot of that in there. Uh, so then I started adding a little bit better annotation on the x-axis. I got feedback from individuals uh, in my research group that they were saying that actually one of the things they liked about my candy coded version was the labeling of poor service access and better service access. So again, it was kind of mapping the words onto the graphic and things that you'd say out loud. So instead of just saying time one and time two, I added time one poor service access and time two better service access. Uh, so that it might draw your attention more to the fact that there's, you know, less green than yellow in time one and more, more green than yellow in time two. I added back my little top line because I liked that annotation going across. Uh, and then I added in that second line again, estimates of prevalence based on individuals accessing services can create an illusion of an increase in prevalence over time. We got feedback that the word illusion was really helpful for people because it kind of drew their attention to the fact that that's actually the numbers that you see reported. You see the green numbers reported. You don't see the yellow because the yellow are just things that we are, we know based on epidemiology, we know that we're not capturing the whole sample. Um, and this is one, uh, one possible version of um, uh, reality that you're seeing based on the green numbers, but our point being that the, the version based on the yellow going all the way across is still possible. Uh, and then because it was a book chapter and because we couldn't use color, I went to a black and white version, which I actually liked. So, you know, figuring out how to have not filled circles um, and filled circles. Um, but this is kind of, uh, this is a version that was published in uh, one of my next book chapters. Uh, and then after I went to Our Lady's Melbourne, I got some really good feedback that maybe a waffle version might be good. So this was after a package came out that, I believe the package came out after I had done this original work. So I hadn't known about it, but uh, I think it's Gigi Waffle. <laughs> um, and this was kind of nice. It's actually often used in epidemiological research to show these kinds of proportions. So the idea of it being that no longer are you kind of taking my word for it, that um, those, because uh, even here you might have to, to really believe me, you might have to count that those, uh, that all the dots in column one uh, equal all the dots in column two. But if you look at the, the waffle chart, then you don't have to take my word for that anymore, right? You, you now can see that I have the exact same number of squares. And then this still kind of gets me to the point where I can verbally talk out loud about it, where I can say that here, each square is an individual affected with autism. The yellow ones are individuals not, affecting, not accessing services and the green is the, are those effect, uh, accessing services. And then I got a little nuts thinking that for presentations like this, I would love to use GG Animate. And this was a whole, whole thing for me. <laughs> GG Animate did not come naturally to me. It was definitely before a lot of the documentation was written up. Um, so I really suffered with GG Animate and I'm not even sure if these actually work or not. But yeah, like I kind of tried to make like the lines appear <laughs> and then the words sort of float in and I'm embarrassed to tell you how many uh, hours this whole thing took me. But uh, I, I thought it was fun to play with and I also thought it was nice to kind of um, be able to verbally walk through you know all of the um, the elements because I usually talked about it kind of going from top to bottom so I usually talked about it from uh, estimates of prevalence are based on the population they can be uh, stable over time and then I would talk about the the second line there um, ultimately for presentations like this one I find it a little bit easier to have slightly different versions add the layers as I go from one slide to the next because then I'm in control of the incrementing and I found that this um, kind of animated GIF sort of gets you talking a little bit fast at some points or slowing down to get to the next loop because you're not fully in control of it. So I think this is actually kind of better if you have a different medium, maybe if you have a blog post or something like that um, and uh, you, you want people to see the kind of dynamic presentation, which does help and it does, you know, um, uh, draw people's attention to different places at different times, which this graphic does sort of require you to do. Uh, and then I think this one is animated as well. Yeah, so you can see I started playing with like the yellow and green, adding those in. And then here I made it so that like 
all the dots would get colored at some point and figuring out the timing of that so that they all come in as one color and then you see the not accessing and accessing services. Uh, so all of these are just kind of uh, toying around with ways to better be able to talk about this stuff out loud because I think that the, the main point of most graphics that you make are to communicate some kind of message and a lot of times you might have to make slightly different versions for a print version versus an interactive version and it's kind of fun if you have a presentation to be able to play around with a little bit more bells and whistles and make it a little bit more jazzy which is what I was trying to do. So uh, that is the end of my take a sad plot and make it better. I think this is a plot that I will uh, always continue to love to uh, talk about and try to make better. I'm no longer on book chapters uh, associated with autism um, prevalence anymore. So I don't really have the, the prod that I used to have to be able to use it as an excuse to learn more GG plot or GG animate. Um, but uh, I think I think it's maybe a useful case study to think about, you know, over time, I would say that the, the iterations that I showed you took me about like three years total uh, to work through. Um, so I think it's helpful to think about projects that you might have that allow you the freedom to be able to do that and give you um, give you a platform that you already understand, a data set that maybe you're super familiar with that help you experiment and, uh, and try new things um, and ask different questions because there were certainly a lot of things like the GG waffle package that allowed me to do things that I wouldn't have thought possible before. So um, I'm happy to take any questions and want to say thanks for inviting me to come here. I really appreciate it. Thanks for coming. That was brilliant. Um, I'm also <laughs> glad that we, we recorded it because I think the old meetups were done in person and I've actually looked at the slides before, but now the full story, now having it <laughs> narrated is much better. <laughs> There's a lot more um, making fun of yourself when you talk yeah. about it in person. <laughs> and, and that's beautiful. It's easy to talk about a plot that you made that's awful. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm happy to take any questions. I haven't been watching the chat, so maybe I can let you um, uh, send them to me. I'm on a very small screen, so it's hard for me to um, go through. I'll exit my full screen, but um, if you want me to go back to any slides. Uh, there's actually no questions that I can see. Uh, everyone's okay. just saying thank you. Um, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm happy to answer any questions about this or other things. Um, anything um, that uh, in the yes. Markdown ecosystem, if you want. Yes. Uh, if if you also would like to uh, unmute yourself and ask the question, that's also perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. uh, so please do. I have a question, if I may. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, hi, Alison. I just wanted to ask, do you find that graphing has greatly improved in the last couple of years? I feel like that the tools have improved substantially, but still there are so many bad graphs out there that we see day to day where people invert right to left reading on the X axis and those sorts of things. Uh, what's your view on this? Um, you know, I, I can't say that I have been exposed much to bad visualizations lately. I think I'm probably, now that I'm um, not in academia <laughs> as much, I see a lot more of like popular news um, and uh, data visualization journalism, which I think has gotten kind of, it's kind of like moved the bar, I think. Um, I suspect every time I look back at academic journals, I'm like, oof, that, that's a rough one. Um, and so I guess coming from where I came from, I think my general, um, my general take on that is that I feel like everybody, like you, you saw my plots and I can laugh about them now, but I feel like everybody is trying um, to make good things with the tools that they have. And I think it's really hard um, with the tools that most people have access to, to be able to make decent things. Um, so uh, so I, I tend to really try to, to come from the lens of thinking about like, um, they're doing their best with what they have <laughs> and I get that because I I mean I showed you a published plot that I am not proud of and I think a lot of people probably have that in their histories or maybe they have ones that they're not totally comfortable saying that out loud because they don't know how to make it better yet um so I think uh I think that's probably where my um uh I kind of tend to to view uh, data visualizations that I see that are done poorly kind of through that lens Um, I have a question. Oh, cool. Yes. Oh, no, Go for sorry. It. Thank you. Hi, Alison. My name's Alicia. 
Um, nice. Thank you so much, our ladies, for organizing this. It's my first time joining the Joburg one, so it's really cool to, to say hello and to meet other women doing this. Hi. This is awesome. Okay, I'm very excited. Um, awesome presentation. I really like the use of the dots. Um, I can <laughs> No, but seriously, because I can see the benefit in terms of um, if someone were to, for example, for industry or research, were to report, for example, descriptive statistics like averages, um, mm -hmm. and the distribution underlying it is actually skew, those dots would illustrate that. Mm -hmm. So exactly. there's a lot of you know, additional information in there. Mm -hmm. um, whereas the waffle, pot, waffle plot doesn't do that, because it's a, it seems like a binary kind of, you know, um, it, maybe depending the way that you do it, if it's three or four mm -hmm. outcomes or whatever. But yeah. I was wondering, yeah. what, what, what would be your final, like if you had to give, I don't know, three things that you think any data scientist or any analyst or researcher should bear in mind when they are doing a plot, what would it be? Because mm. surely there's got to be something that connects all data visualization to some extent. That's a really good question. Um, I think one of the things, uh, if I had three, my first one would be to worry about um, accessibility, um, mm -hmm. color contrast, or um, uh, size of the text even, um, things like that. Even if you're not necessarily designing for a screen reader, um, mm. being able to have people in your audience even who are looking at slides who can see what your graphic is showing you. I know I've attended a lot of talks where a slide has a graphic and I'm in the back and I can't see anything. Oh. I can't tell the difference between colors. I can't tell what words are on the screen. And so I think like really kind of thinking about accessibility from the perspective of what is the medium here? You know, is this a website? Then you have a little bit more freedom to be able to you know, use HTML and harness that. If it's going to be a book chapter, you're going to be needing to worry about black and white contrast if you're using grayscale. Um, so thinking about those kinds of elements, like not just from uh, the point of view of somebody who might need to use a screen reader, but all users, um, you know, mm -hmm. making it more accessible for, um, uh, for everyone. I think that's one thing. Um, the, the second thing I would say is to really leverage um, the container that it's in. Okay. So when I taught data visualization, um, one of the things that we found, we, we, we iterated on it over three years, this course. And the first year we taught it, we focused mainly on the plot itself. And we found that at the end of the semester or quarter actually, when we had students do presentations, mm -hmm. uh, we found that they were stumbling over this static plot because they were in person and it was um, a plot that they had maybe made and perfected in this one little place, but they hadn't really thought about the bigger picture of how it was going to be presented and talked about. Okay. So thinking about like, is this going to live in a slide deck? Does this need to live, you know, on a website? Can I harness the power of whatever my medium is to make this more digestible to people? Um, mm. So we really kind of focused in our data visualization class about thinking about what we called wrapping up a data viz. So, you know, there's just, there's the plot and definitely make that good, but like, what's the other stuff around it? Because no one is just going through and looking at just plots. Um, they're hoping for words maybe in an article or a blog post, or if you're doing a slide deck, they're hoping for your words to help mm. them organize what they're seeing. Um, so that was really important because we found that people um, can optimize for, uh, for sort of the static presentation. And then in some ways that doesn't really serve many actual audiences at the end. Um, right. that, that would most mimic like a book chapter or something mm. like that. Um, and then a third one I think um, is thinking about how you're actually gonna talk out loud about it. So like not just the container when it's delivered, but like actually walking through with another person, even if it's like your mom or your partner, <laughs> someone who doesn't know <laughs> this and being able to see where you're tripping over your words. Yes. Um, if you're, because even if it's something for like a publication, like being able to sit down and say like, okay, what is the, what is the message behind this that you want people to see? And sometimes it may be that the visualization is not, not actually critical. Like that first person who responded to me on help me this, you know, suggested like, does this need a chart? Um, and he may have been right, because he just wasn't seeing the message that I was trying to mm. communicate. But I did have a really um, important message. And I felt like in order to get that message across, I ended up writing like two paragraphs um, in a text that no one would read, right? Mm. Um, and so being able to have some kind of visualization to be able to use was, um, was helpful to think about. But I, I did find that 
presenting, you know, kind of works in progress and talking out loud to people helped me a lot with seeing the rough spots and making mm. it better. So I think like talking out loud about things, I know in the R world, people talk a lot about, um, you know, the importance of talking about your code out loud, but I think narrating your plot and thinking about how you want to, um, even if it's not going to be something where the actual container that you deliver it in is going to be able to have your verbal message, even if it's for a static book chapter or something, thinking about like, here's the story that I want to tell with this plot. Here's, here's where I want to draw the user's attention to. And then, you know, if you, if you are publishing something that's not going to be presented verbally, you know, n structuring your narrative around that, that you've written out in the same way that you would actually talk about it out loud. Um, I think, uh, I think that's really invaluable um, to helping people digest like information from, mm -hmm. from graphics, because I, I think one thing that I learned from teaching data viz for three years was that like, you know, you can't just rely on the plot. Like, there, and there's no reason why you should have to, right? There's like, there's no one holding your hands down and saying like, you simply can't <laughs> complement this plot with words or, you know, when you're talking about it with slides, you know? So thinking about those uh, elements, I think are really helpful. And then it can also kind of free you a little bit if you're lacking the skills to be able to make the changes you want on the actual plot. Um, yeah. Awesome, thank you. That's very helpful. I appreciate yeah. it. That was a great question. Thank you. Uh, Alison, there was a question here in the, the first, there's a few questions. Okay. This one is from um, Alejandra, I hope I've said that right. Mm -hmm. I have a question about how you choose your colors. How do you ensure that they are <laughs> adequate for colorblind people? Yes. Uh, so I did not choose these colors when I knew about packages for screening for colorblindness with, um, uh, especially with the two, like the yellow and the green, not a good choice. Um, so uh, I typically nowadays um, use uh, the Okabe Ito color scales, which I believe are built into a few different packages. Uh, but there, there's also a lot of really great color packages that are available now. Um, uh, and many of them are bundled up into one by um, Emil Hvilfeldt um, called Palatier. Uh, so a lot of times I'll do like a, um, there's a, one of my favorite websites, it's called I think accessiblecolors.com uh, and it allows you to get color contrast ratings for two hex colors. So I like using that a lot. I think there's actually R functions that allow you to do that, but um, I typically look at that and try to make sure that I have a high enough color contrast between uh, the two um, colors that I'm choosing. Um, so that's nowadays what I do, but these plots that I showed you today are not, um, were before I understood that really, I didn't, um, uh, I didn't know that packages existed that allowed you to screen for those. I think now I forget what the color blindness um, screening package is. It's in my data visualization teaching materials, um, but, uh, but there is a package that allows you to even see what your color, um, what your colors look like to somebody with all the different kinds of color blindness and screen those. Um, so I think those are, those are really helpful. And those are things that I ended up teaching in data viz, but uh, didn't use at this time um, when I was making these slides. Oh, that's very cool. I didn't even think about this. Such a lovely question. And, and it's so interesting <laughs> to know that there's all these packages. Um, there are so many color packages. Like people have gone color crazy. Um, there's so there there's so many to choose from. So um, uh, you can do that. You can also just kind of pick your own um, from yeah. like you know any kind of color palette uh, that you can find online. You can just look at the color contrast and make sure that it's got a high enough contrast between the two things. Yeah. Um, there's another question here, and I'm not sure anyone no no one's replied to it. Maybe you know. If you don't, obviously you're welcome to. Okay. Just just. Move the question. <laughs> okay. Anissa asks, uh, this is a question for the forum, but uh, but no one's replied. But does anyone know what is happening with Gigi Plotly and its development? Gigi Plotly, I do not know the answer to that question, but it's funny that that comes up because I think that was just used um, uh, by one of my colleagues in a blog post. And I was like, oh, hey, there's Gigi Plotly. I haven't seen it in a while. So um, I'm happy to try to dig around and I can communicate back with the organizers and see if I can find out. I believe it was originally developed by Carson Siebert, who's at our studio. So I might be able to ping him and uh, see what is what is going on with that package, but I can't say that I know, um, I haven't used Plotly in quite some time, so. There we go, Anissa. Um, and then there's, there were actually just a few uh, links here in the chat with color palettes. Ah, uh, perfect. Yeah. So, yes. <laughs> uh, anybody have um, any other questions you'd like to, you can unmute or put, put it in the chat.
Otherwise, we have to let her go back to her family and her day job. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you so, all for this. This was so fun. It was a nice, uh, nice lunchtime <laughs> treat. It's a nice evening treat for us. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Alison. Okay, we're just getting lots of thank yous in yes. the chat. Okay. All right. Well, I will uh, stop sharing. I just realized I'm still sharing. All right. Well, thank you all. I hope you all have a good rest of the night. And thanks for um, the invitation. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. For thank you, Alison. Bye.